Hi everyone, this is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 134. I'm speaking with Bob Scott from Pixar. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Okay, so welcome to another episode. Uh, I hope you enjoyed last week's episode with Ryan Connolly from Film Riot. I had a blast. It was really awesome. This week is going to be another really cool one. This is with Bob Scott from Pixar. And I'm really excited for this one because Bob came from working at Warner Brothers and a lot of more traditional animation houses back in the day. And I thought this would be really interesting to cover his transition from the traditional world to something that we're dealing with a lot these days, which is disruptive innovation. So in Bob's case, it was changing careers into the world of 3D, which I'm sure for a lot of people would be very intimidating, but he was one who was able to see the writing on the wall and adapt rather than stick to what he knew and slowly over time see that industry start to really dissolve quite a lot. And I feel like it's starting to come back a little bit. I'm really excited to see and I hope to see a lot more traditionally animated, cell animated feature films, especially from Disney in the future. But I think it's pretty amazing to go down this journey with Bob as he changed careers. He was able to adapt and continue to evolve as an animator. And his whole journey at Pixar very early into Pixar's development and all the amazing stories he has to tell. So I'm really excited for this one. If you want to check out the show notes, go to alamckay.com slash 134 for episode 134. And if you can take a moment before this episode starts to quickly share this around, that would mean the world to me. That being said, let's dive in. Cool. So again, thanks for taking the time out to chat. And like, do you want to quickly just introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, my name is Bob Scott, and I'm a story artist currently working at Disney. Um, okay, awesome. And yeah, I mean, just quickly uh, to kind of dive into your past a little bit. Uh, sure. Did you always want to be an artist, or did you kind of get into it later on? Like, how did it kind of initially start? I'm just kind of curious because some people, you know, they come out of the womb and they're, you know, ready with uh, pen and paper, ready to do amazing art, and other people later in life kind of discover their passion and kind of go for it there. So, What's the story with you? Yeah, you know, I was obsessed with cartoons as a, as a small child. My mom goes back and always tells the story about how when I was just a toddler, she could turn on the TV and put on a cartoon for a little bit and get, get a little peace and quiet. <laughs> so <laughs> um, something about it just always, always fascinated me, whether it was newspaper comic strips, comic books, or animation. I just, um, yeah, just was born to, to, to be interested in it. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, yeah. And what uh, about later on? Like, uh, did you, I, I guess, like, when did you decide that you actually wanted to do it for a living? Because, you know, again, like, I think that a lot of people yeah. have that uh, misconception and that, you know, art is more of a hobby rather than a career. So for you, like, when did you decide, like, hey, I could actually make a living from this? You know, at a very young age, I really wanted to to go into animation somehow. I didn't really know how, you know, when I was really young. Um, we we're talking like... Um, you know, first, second, third grade. Even mm -hmm. then, I knew I wanted to do something like that. Wow. I was I was always involved in in some sort of artistic thing, um, whether it was being in the school play or you know puppetry or that kind of thing. But I just um, my mom was very I, I very lucky I had very encouraging parents, and my mom was of that generation. Like you can do anything you want to do, you know. And and she saw that I had the interest in art would bring home pads of paper for me, uh, my brothers as well, and, and sketch. And, and um, you know, I asked her one time, I said, how did you, because I have all these friends who went into animation, they all have stories about how their parents thought, oh, you can't go into art, you can't go into animation, mm -hmm. you're going to be a starving artist or whatever. And I asked my mom uh, not too long ago, how did you, you know, you were so encouraging. What made you think that I could make it? She said, well, I saw the names on the credits and figured somebody was making those cartoons. <laughs> so she just for some reason had that instinct that 
that yeah somebody's doing this there's there's got to be a way you know if, if you work hard enough at it and that's what you, your, your passion is that that was a way to make a living so that's awesome uh, yeah so even though i knew it would be hard it wasn't wasn't to say that i thought oh this is going to be easy to do um i knew there was there were people out there that did it and i would check out books from the library um, one of them that I checked out a lot as a kid was uh, about Charles Schultz, and it was actually about not only his comic strip, but the animated TV specials that had some interviews with Bill Melendez and things like that. So I would check those types of books out and read about the people that actually did this for a living. Mm-hmm. Uh, super inspiring. It was way before the internet. So, yeah. Well, I was just yeah. about to bring that up because I feel like these yeah. days everyone's a bit more gifted in the sense that um, you know if they want to do something, they can just go on YouTube or they can Google it. And I feel like, especially back then, you know, it's it's obviously a different media to medium to like 3D, but um, yeah. it's it's definitely something that like I can't imagine you can just decide, hey, I want to do this, and you know, uh, Google um, what steps to take. So I mean, for you, when you kind of decided to kind of go down that path, um, you know, as a career, like how did you connect the dots? Because I imagine like part of it is yeah, going getting the traditional. Uh, you know, studying background and, and doing a bit of that. But I imagine yeah. most of it back then would be more about who you meet, who can kind of be the, the gateway keepers to get you in. Yeah, well, it was, you know, I grew up in the 70s and the library was really the thing that where I could find all the information. And uh, somehow uh, I found out about, you know, getting addresses to the studios through the library. So I wrote all the studios as a kid and asked them questions. I I wrote um, Disney and got a nice letter back from Eric Larson. Mm-hmm. Uh, this would be around high school age. And he I actually sent my drawings. He gave me a critique. Um, it was super helpful. I mean, I was nowhere near ready to, you know, to, to move in animation at that age. But, but the advice he gave me was great, you know, just keep drawing. And, you know, he gave me a, an honest critique of, of my work. I remember writing to Chuck Jones. I got a letter. I still have the, the letter that he uh, answered with, I assume it's him. Maybe it was a secretary that helped write it or, or, or an assistant or something. Um, but, but those types of things were really encouraging. And yeah, without the internet, there was no other way to find that stuff. I feel like the kids nowadays coming up, the portfolios that I see, um, the people who are good are light years ahead of, I think where a lot of (laughs) people my age at that time were at, because they have so much more information and and ways to, to learn. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, anytime I go on like uh, art station or places like that, it's just looking at the kids coming out with like amazing work that, you know, I look at my work back in the 90s and it, it was terrible, but it <laughs> took so much work to do that. And, you know, yeah, all I had was like a little book, you know, and that's all to like, kind of teach me. So, um, yeah, like it's just amazing now to kind of see like how great the tools are and also how yeah. – people like I think have been able to embrace this a lot more as a career rather than like am I risking everything going down this path it's like no like it's tried and proven now there's a lot more jobs and obviously a lot more competition but um, yes yeah it's a serious thing now and so much is animated nowadays as you know being an effects person I mean you know half the movies Marvel and Star Wars are are animated you know in some way shape or form so there's even more animation now than there. Mm. there's ever been which is um yeah you're right it's it's a very viable career yeah i actually just watched um don't judge me but i watched um justice league the other day and uh, okay nice (laughs) despite the the mustache part um you know like the cg face uh for superman i mean yeah it it seemed like a majority of the film i felt like 50 percent of the film like anytime someone was moving you would have a character you know an actor performance and then it would be cg for half the fight sequence and occasionally cut into the actual performance again so it's just yeah, amazing yeah. now that like yeah it's just getting that point of you know you 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 have the iconic shots to tie it back to the actor and the rest of the time it's just all cg yeah and even movies you wouldn't think there's cg in it mm-hmm. there are cg backgrounds or sets or things that you know you don't even uh, you know the average person wouldn't even realize you know yeah so it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing <laughs> what was the leader caprio movie he finally got an oscar for a while ago um i trying to remember the name of it oh is it the um oh, i know what you're i know the one you're thinking of and i can't I'm cheating really right quick now. and um okay. and, and googling it but yeah i mean i looked at that movie which i'll bring yeah. up in a second but uh yeah the, Re- <laughs> the revenant yeah so the revenant, yeah, right, I, yeah i just remember watching that movie and i had my 
my wife's dad kind of echoing in my head as the credits were about to start, like, yeah. you know, that's a real movie. You don't need that computer crap. And, and so, it, you know, it was one of those movies I'm like, yeah, I can't wait to watch the credits because like 80% of the film was all CG and it was, it's just, it yeah. Was, is more more uh, credits in that than you would see in Avatar or something. So uh, even yeah. even the best movies these days, and I think Forrest Gump is a great example of where you can still use CG to tell a story rather than it being like Transformers, where it's more uh, you get numb from just watching too much stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's really opened up the um, you know television. I mean, with HBO mm-hmm. and things like Game of Thrones, and yeah. you know. I've- think of like what we had in the seventies growing up. I mean, you couldn't do a show like that because you'd have to build the sets. You'd have to do matte paintings or, or models or something that'd be really expensive and not that CG is cheap, but I mean, there's just, there's just so much more they can do to make this stuff uh, more yeah. convincing than it was back then. <laughs> I love the budgets like have gone up too. I was speaking with a few studios in LA about who do a lot of Marvel shows and especially oh. with Marvel now, like, some of the episodes go up to a million to one and a half million dollars which just blows my mind like you know wow. that, that's what some feature films like low budget feature films would cost back in the day so I, I love the fact that there is that faith being put into tv to like to do it right these days opposed to you know it's just yeah. tv whatever that's true yeah television i mean, remember it used to be sort of considered the lesser mm-hmm. you know too it's like movies were the high end really well done things and and television you know wasn't and now it's like television sometimes better than movies you know that really right. it's, it's about storytelling and, and the quality is there so that's right and i totally derailed you but um oh that's like, okay <laughs> but I, I thought it was fascinating just kind of going down that that path and like i i do think it's also fascinating that you you know were able to kind of have the ambition in the very beginning to show that initiative and like hit the library go to wherever your key resources were and and not be afraid to reach out like i think most people they don't reach out to somewhere until they think that they're ready which is probably 10 years later than it should be and uh, i think that right. it's pretty awesome that you're just like all right like i gotta go and create my own fate so let's go and do this yeah somehow yeah i think it you know really stemmed from my parents and and just the the thirst for wanting the knowledge or how is this done like it was it was you know such a mystery you know once in a while there'd be a wonderful world of disney sunday show where they would show how an animated cartoon was made. You would just, I would just look at that and try to remember whatever I, I could, you know, finding out about cells that, that you didn't have to redraw the background over and over. Like that was mm-hmm. a revelation and just, you know, anything that, any way I could find out about it, uh, I would. That's awesome. That's really cool. And I guess to that point of like reaching out to all these places and at least kind of getting uh, some kind of encouraging feedback, but like for, for you, at that point, like, where was the bridge that kind of finally got you in? Like, were there a few key people that you found, or what was the connection that got me into uh, into the industry? Yeah, I guess going wow. from having the passion to kind of connecting the dots into like, yeah, getting into the industry or getting close. Yeah, well, um, it's funny. I met uh, some friends. I was friends with. Um, so I was going to a Catholic school, and there was an art program. Uh, at the the local public school that the school I was going to in high school was allowing us to to have a, it was a career center. Mm -hmm. And there was an art class there that I was getting to take with a couple other friends. And it was a um, drawing class for like logos and advertising and that sort of thing. They were just trying to, kids who had some ability who were interested and were getting to, you know, spend a couple days a week there, um, like two or three hours. And I just only talked about animation. And there was a, guy, a, a kid there who said, boy, you got to meet this guy, Dan Jupe. He is, he's just like you. He, all he talks about is Disney animation, Disney animation. And so he introduced me to him. Dan was going to another, another school in Michigan. And we became friends. And he was far above uh, uh, what I was doing at the time. And I, I learned a lot from him. He, was, he already had his own uh, you know, uh, animation stand, you know, uh, mm-hmm. drawing board and everything. And so there was a lot, you know, just seeing that was, was exciting. Like here's, here's a kid who's a year older than me and he's, he's doing stuff that is pretty amazing. So it, it made it seem even more doable. It's like, wow, okay. Uh, maybe I can get there. You know, here's somebody who's really good. Cool. So I was lucky to have, you know, a, someone like that, that I met. And there was another friend of mine, Butch Hartman, who's gone on to be the fairly odd parents. He was a childhood friend, so I met him through somebody else. And so Butch, Dan, and I were really close friends around high school. We all went to different high schools, but we would 
would hang out together, talk about animation. I had a Super 8 camera, um, which was the star of some of my Super 8 movies. And, you know, he'd come on the weekends and we'd goof around with stuff. And, and so, yeah, I think those people are out there that, that you might not even know in your neighborhood or in your school that, that probably have the same sort of affinity or love for something you like. And, and I think you, you gravitate towards those people, you know, I would gravitate to anybody at school that liked comic books. It's like, even if they Mm -hmm. didn't draw, it's like, well, here's a cue I can relate to, or we can relate to each other, have, have these common interests. I think it's really important. Like the, the sooner you identify that the better, because you know, there's so many people that, uh, you end up meeting that down the line, like you end up working with a hundred times and especially yeah. in, in the very beginning too. Like I, I had this discussion the other day, uh, I forget who it was with, but it was basically about like, you know, schools and yeah. wh- whether colleges are good for you or not. And um, my whole philosophy was that, you know, actually is with one of the directors at Lucasfilm. I, I remember now we're on a call. Um, sorry, but yeah, it's, it's just one of those things that I, I do feel like schools are good for people who kind of don't, have that motivation themselves and need that structure. But um, if you're someone who is hungry, uh, I think that you can learn a lot more on your own uh, a lot quicker. But the one thing that I think that schools have going for them is the fact that you are going to be around other people who share the same passion as you. And in in addition to that, I think that it's also important because one of you might end up like graduating and going off, you know, and doing amazing things. And all it takes is that one to then pull everyone else in wherever they go. And I see it all the time. One kid comes in and is like, oh, I know three other people who are really talented. Can we bring them in as well? And suddenly you bring in your, your little group, your posse, and you get to start working on shots. Oh, absolutely. I mean, everybody you went to school with, you know, whoever got in first was helping the other people get in. You know, it was it was all about um, you want to bring your friends in because you're you're the new guy and, and some of the people are older than you. And it's like, hey, I, I know this friend that's really good, and they're looking for a storyboard artist on this show. It's like, you know, mm-hmm. so you definitely, I think everybody helps each other out. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's a really good point. And just being surrounded by the that many people that like what you like and are passionate about it, and and are coming from the same, um, you know, a point you are. It's like you know, how many kids knew who Chuck Jones was when I was growing up? You know, and then you go to Cal Arts. It's like what well, every student knows who Chuck Jones is, or every student knows who, you know, Bob mm-hmm. Clampett is, or you know, these are the old Warner's directors, and and uh, so that was exciting. Now I I see that kids can find that online. You know, they can find people who like the same things they like. Mm. Uh, but it, but it's rare, and, and my situation was rare having two friends that were you know, interested in comics and animation. And, and all of us ended up going to Cal Arts. Uh, Dan before me, he was older than myself and then, and which uh, went later. So, um, yeah, so I I agree. The more people you can be around, I think uh, the the better you'll get. And it's, it's, it's also good to be around people that are better than you because you're going to learn a ton. You know, if you stay in your own little bubble and don't take any advice or critique from anybody, you know, you're not going to get as far as fast, you know, I don't think, I mean, there are some people that are just truly gifted and they figure it all out on their own, you know, but even they probably had somebody, a mentor or somebody they looked up to or learned from. But I think that that is like the most underrated advice ever about, you know, surrounding yourself with people better than you. Cause I think it is very easy for everyone. Like even now, like if you get really good at something, you can have all your, your buddies or your colleagues around you praise you about like how talented you are, but yeah. You know, do you want to be in that circle where you are at the top of the, the you know, the bucket or whatever and everyone right. tells you how awesome you are? Or do you want to be at the bottom where you've got people who are way better than you who are essentially pulling you up, you know? Yeah, so. exactly. Um, and I think, yeah, sometimes the instinct is just, oh, I don't want to show anybody this because it's, you know, I'm nervous they're not going to like it. And, you know, everyone still has that. Even when you're a professional, you get nervous when you got to show your boards or, you know, picture scenes or whatever. Um, but it's good and it's healthy because you get good notes and, mm. and, and good feedback. And it's also fun to see what other people are doing. Like, cause I work in stories. So we pitch everything in front of the director in front of the other story team. And some, and a lot of times the writers are in there as well. And so it's fun to see what other people pitch too, because they'll, you might've known those script pages that they got. And it's fun to see what they brought to it that you would have never thought of. That's right. Um, you know, and sometimes you can you can really underestimate yourself. You think, oh, I'm not going to go for that gag or that idea in my boards because that seems so obvious. I mean, I'm not going to do that. That's the most obvious thing. 
you think it's obvious, but then you do that gag and nobody saw it coming. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to other storyboard artists, the same thing happens. Like, boy, that got a huge laugh. I, I thought that was so obvious. Like, no, I never would have thought of that. That's a great idea, you know. So everyone brings something of themselves to, to a film, you know. Mm -hmm. That's um, great. That's really yeah. cool. And I guess from you, like, what was the first project, like, when you did? Because, again, like, I, I love hearing about the, the path you had to go through. And, again, I think that it, it already says a lot about your character, about how you are someone who's kind of self-sustained and you can um, kind of kick your own butt into, you know, getting to where you need to go. But when you did kind of land that initial first gig, like, where was that at? The first stuff I ever did was was freelance. Um and I'm trying to remember which one came first. And I'm actually can't can't remember at this point. Um, well, a friend of mine at Cal Arts, uh, he got a job. Um, he was he was working at Cal. He was going to Cal Arts, and then he got some uh, work at a place called uh, DIC Productions. They did uh, an old show called The Get Along Gang. They did um, Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling and that kind of thing. And he it was one of those situations where he they needed some layout artists and, and he said, Oh, I got my friends at Cal arts, you know, that, that could do this. So a, f a bunch of us, the three or four of us got to go work there a couple days and do layouts for a show called get along gang, which is, which is a show from the, <laughs> from the, um, like 1981, I think, or no, wait, I'm sorry. No, no, uh, I'm sorry. 84 or five, something like that. Okay. Uh, and so that was like, that was the first chance to do something professional. We were so excited. It's like, wow, we get to sit in a studio and at a, at a table and draw these, you know, these characters, even though it wasn't the most fun show or the best show, mm -hmm. you know, just to be getting paid for, for that. And then there was also uh, Disney was uh, looking for people to do freelance on a thing called sport goofy, which was directed by a, a guy named Daryl Van Sitters. who has gone on to, he's a Disney animator and director. And he went on to start renegade productions and they do tons and tons of, commercials and TV stuff and they're doing new Tom and Jerry shorts now, but he, yeah, for, for television, uh, he was looking for Cal arts people to do freelance and sport goofy. So, uh, the kind of, I can't remember how we got word of it, but a bunch of us got to go down and show our portfolios and he gave us scenes to do. And, you know, so that was super exciting. I mean, that was like to, to animate for Disney. It was, and it was, a uh, it was originally going to be a theatrical featurette and then eventually got broadcast on television, but, but he was part of the special projects unit. So they didn't have a huge budget and he wanted to use young people from Cal arts and, and yeah, so that was, that was just a thrill, you know, you get to work on that stuff. And I feel like I did not know what I was doing at all because the difference between working on your own Cal arts film and working professionally mm -hmm. was just so different because it, you know, at Cal arts we're doing at that time we were doing pencil test animation. So everything was rough and none of it was cleaned up. And so I didn't know anything about, you know, how to set up my scene for an assistant animator to, you know, clean that up. Uh, so, you know, I just learned a lot about, you know, in-betweens and, and charting your drawings. I mean, the old days with, with 2D, you would chart your drawings, you'd have your extreme drawings and then your in-betweens, you'd have to do some sort of chart so the assistant would know how to in-between that properly. Well, I didn't do that at all. And a friend of mine, he, and he didn't know either, he just cleaned it up straight ahead. So the line was kind of wobbling. He was a great artist and everything, but it was just those types of things that we just didn't know, you know. That's right. And we kind of learned on the job. <laughs> that's cool though. I mean, again, like to anyone, like the whole process that other, it's kind of like what you said before, you know, you take it for granted where some people might understand the process and um, not even think about it. But for someone who's kind of fresh into it, uh, all those little nuances that you, you never even think about are, are all something that you've got to learn and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. take in. That's cool. And I guess for you, like, um, when do you think there there was a point in your career where you kind of felt like you finally kind of made it? Because I, I feel like, you know, initially everyone's kind of treading on water a little bit and they're a little bit, um, you know, like, okay, cool. I'm, right. I'm hoping this is going to work out. But at some point you're like, all right, I know Kung Fu. I'm good now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I can well, hold my own I, in a bar fight. I don't know if you ever feel that 100%. Um, but, you know, I've been in it long enough that I, 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 you know, there's enough work out there. I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm okay, but even still you, you wonder, you don't, you know, things change and the industry changes and you, you get older and you wonder what, am I still viable? Will I still be able to get work or, you know, I mean, those insecurities creep in. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you, I never don't know if I ever felt like I've arrived. This this is it. It's just always just trying to learn more and and just get better and um, just enjoy the work. That's the main thing. I think if you enjoy it and you do, do the best you can, um, you know that that says a lot to to mm-hmm. employers and stuff. Um, That's yeah. cool. That's really good. I was um, a little rambly, but <laughs> no, 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 I, no, absolutely. Um, no, I completely agree with that. And I think it is also healthy to kind of always be a little bit nervous, you know, rather than saying like, yeah, okay, I'm good. And I feel like there is a certain percentage of people that at a certain point, they're going to feel like, great, I'm, I'm good enough now. I, I got to, you know, I don't need to ever learn again. I can just kind of keep doing what I'm doing and, you know, I don't need to grow. And I feel like right. that's the point where they kind of get lazy and starts to kind of lull. So, uh, you know, I think that the ones who are always kind of like, all right, I got to keep getting better and keep improving, keep growing. I think it's the healthiest kind of mindset to have. Yeah, because I think you you get bored if you just keep repeating yourself. If you can try and try things to challenge you um, and get get in the deep end of the pool again, sometimes out of your comfort zone, it can be difficult, but it can it can be a, a mm. huge, you know, asset because you're going to learn something that you didn't have before. It's another tool you've got you know? Yeah. No, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to uh, jump around for a second, but I was just uh, curious, I, do you have much 3D background as well? Like obviously later in your career or? Did yeah. You... So I went to Pixar uh, in 1999. I was there for about 11 and a half years. And so that was the first time I did anything with 3D. I started there in story on Monsters Incorporated. I, I did a year in story on that film and then uh, two years in story on The Incredibles. And then I segued from that uh, to computer animation. That's awesome. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll loop back to that, but like, sure. I'll let that be a bit of a teaser, but yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Cause, um, yeah, I think that that I think is just a fascinating, you know, kind of, uh, experience in its own, just kind of looking at the traditional ways of, of doing animation and then essentially the oncoming threat of 3d, but at the same time, like, a you know, being able to embrace that as well. So I think that, you know, that would be pretty fascinating to chat about too. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And um, yeah, just curious, like with, you know, earlier in your career, I mean, what was the first feature film that you got to work on? The first feature was Fern Gully. Um, the, it was a film done by Croyer Films back in 90, when was I, when was I there? 91 or two, I think. Um, and that was the first uh, experience on a feature animated movie. All I'd worked on before that were shorts or television things. Um, and it was, it was, was new to me to be on something that long. Usually I was used to something, you know, lasting a month or two and then you get a new assignment. It was something totally different. So it felt like, I mean, it was only on the movie, I think for seven or eight months, but to me at that time, it just felt like forever. I'm like, I'm still drawing the same character. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, this, is, this, uh, this just seems like it's going to go on forever. But then after years of that, you kind of get used to it and, and a year goes by in a movie and it doesn't seem like it's like a blink of the eye, you know, you don't even think about it. <laughs> What's your opinion of that? Like, what do you prefer? Like, tie to turnaround projects or ones that you get to really kind of take ownership of and, and spend long amounts of time on? I, I enjoy now being on something longer, like a, a year or two on a feature. I'm used to features now. So, so a couple of years on a feature, like Incredibles was three years. You know, that was story and animation. So that was one of the longer ones I was on. Um, I kind of like that because you really, you get to, you know, get used to working with everybody. And especially if it's a really good film and a good situation that you're enjoying, you want to enjoy it as long as you can. And um, yeah, so I I think in in usually a lot of people would would say this, that you feel like the last scene that you animate, whether it's on the computer or or traditional animation is when you finally near the end of the film, you're really cooking and you start to feel like I'm finally getting a hold of this character you know it just it just takes a long time to to find it you know to where you start feeling like oh i can i can animate this much easier than i did in the beginning <laughs> so yeah. it's nice to get to that point if you're not on it very long you don't get to, get to yeah go that. no that's but, good you get to get to yeah. get into a rhythm with it that's cool. yeah yeah i'm just curious um you worked on national lampoon's christmas vacation um it's been so long since i've seen that so i'm trying to you know remember where that would be but like what was the contribution for that film oh that was just actually two scenes of freelance for the opening credits uh croyer films that i just mentioned who did fern mm-hmm. Gully, uh run by bill and sue croyer they had a studio and they were doing um uh credits for different movies they'd done commercials and they did that this is before they did fern Gully. 
Um, and so, yeah, I got asked to, to freelance on that. Someone I knew was on it and they handed all the freelance out to many different animators. And so I just have two scenes in there where Santa Claus is stuck inside the chimney. <laughs> that was, that was it. That's cool. Uh, literally a week or two weeks of, of work, but yeah. Um, but yeah, that was fun. And it was fun because it was, it was cartoony. It was a fun, you know, kind of throwback style of animation. And that's the kind of stuff they were doing at that time. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It's just kind of funny to see that on the credits list, but uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those movies that now has become like a, a Christmas classic. So it's kind of like saying I worked in Die Hard or something. It's like, all right. Like, oh, that's funny. That? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, it's funny. I'm in my studio and I have a cell, an actual original cell from one of the scenes I did. Uh, Bill Cryer gave everyone who worked on the film. Oh, that's a, awesome. So yeah, a cell setup. So and, and you didn't have eBay back then, so you actually kept it. I still have it. Yeah, I still that's have good. it. <laughs> yeah, we have a few few things on the wall, different cells and things that we. My, my wife's also an artist, so uh, oh, that's great. Those things that she's worked on as well. Yeah, we met at Cal Arts, so. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And um, just curious, like Road to El Dorado and Prince of Egypt, obviously uh -huh. two of my like I grew up like. I grew up as in early in my career, like sat next to nothing but character animators all around me. So I eventually had to start, you know, appreciating uh -huh. Iron Giant and Road Del Dorado mm -hmm. and Prince of Egypt. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've actually had a few guests who've worked on both those films. Uh, oh, that's here great. As well. Yeah. But like for you, like what were those projects like? Because again, they're, well, they're classics. I love those films. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. So I worked, the first one I worked on was Prince of Egypt was first. And it's funny, I came right from a film called Cats Don't Dance that I was a co-supervisor on, uh, the main character, Danny. And so that was about as far, I mean, you know, the opposite ends of animation styles as, as you could be. And I'd never done anything uh, with humans with, you know, very realistic like that. So I came from that film, which was all very cartoony, Cats Don't Dance, to Prince of Egypt. And I uh, supervised on the character of Miriam, the Sandra Bullock character. We had mm -hmm. a small crew, two animators under me. Um, and uh, the three of us did all the animation for her. And it, it was a, definitely a learning curve. I mean, I, I, the first scene I remember I showed the directors and um, it was just way too cartoony. I thought I was toning it down. I thought this is mm -hmm. realistic. I'm really, <laughs> really getting, I think this, this is going to work. And you know, it was, it was terrible. It was very, very cartoony, not, not for the film at all. And so I just really uh, buckled down and tried to learn, you know, the, a more realistic style. So it, it was, a, it was a great, a great experience to work on that movie. And then El Dorado was next and that was uh, more cartoony. Somewhere. Yeah, I was going to say that one would be a bit more, you know, <laughs> squash and stretch and yeah, exactly. Uh, not as cartoony as Cats Don't Dance, was, which was more like a Warner Brothers, you know, talking mm -hmm. animals. Um, but it, but so I felt like I, I started feeling more comfortable with that um, on that film because I felt like it was, you know, not as realistic as Prince of Egypt. I could bring in some of the stuff, you know, I was doing before that, which was cartoony. So it was a nice, nice uh, middle spot for me that was that was actually really fun to animate on. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. And yeah, just curious actually, because I was just stalking your IMDb. But um, so with uh, with both of those, like you're the supervising animator for a specific character, and like I, yeah. you'd think I would know this, but um, but yeah. So is that essentially you're more there to kind of keep that continuity of the performance throughout uh, the entire? Exactly. Film? Yeah. Cool. I mean, the people that that worked on that when I honestly I didn't have to do very much. They were so good. I mean, like I said, the people who did worked on Miriam. It was, it was more just making sure we drew the characters similarly enough, you know, maybe go over a drawing or two if, if the character didn't look quite the way I was drawing it. Uh, but they were just such top notch animators. It, 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 you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that hard to be honest with you. I and mean, they were really good, but yeah, it's, it's making sure that the acting and the performance and the, and the drawing style are, are in the same vein. Um, so yeah so that's that's basically what a what a supervisor does yeah cool no i was just curious about that because i yeah. hadn't heard about that before but at the same time like it it's something i've always kind of thought about um just because again like you know every animator is going to have their own take on something and having someone there to kind of keep that consistency is pretty uh, important yeah and at the same time i'm trying to draw the character the way uh the designers have, have drawn them because i'm i'm both um el dorado and Prince of Egypt, there were there was somebody who designed the look of the characters and everything. So 
mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn that style and then also um, make sure that whoever is working with me is we're all trying to keep, keep the same, the same look. Yeah. That's awesome. And actually just curious, Andrew Schmidt, actually there's two Andrew Schmidt's at Pixar, isn't there? But um, mm-hmm. Andrew Schmidt, uh, character I made a, um, who's obviously now at DreamWorks, but you know him, right? Oh yeah. Yes. I know yeah. real well. Yeah. yeah. He's on Troll Hunters. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, obviously Pixar is such a big place, but yeah, I was just thinking he's probably someone, if you work with Victor, you'd probably know him and Carlos yes. as well. Carlos Blaine. Oh yeah. I know Carlos. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I was going to get Carlos on the podcast, but uh, he just moved to LA a few months back and we're going to have oh. to wait because he's still uh, working on his film. But once that's done, we're going to loop back around. It should be pretty fun. Oh yeah. He's, he's a great guy. Super, super talented. Oh, both those guys, Andrew and, and yeah, him. Victor, of course, all, all really good. Yeah. Yeah. That, that'd be awesome. He'd be a great interview. That's awesome. Cool. And yeah. Um, yeah. So like 1999, you ended up going off to Pixar. Is that right? Yes. So yes. Uh, at that point, like what triggered you to decide to do that? Like, um, you know, I, I guess well, like for you uh, with currently where you're at, was it kind of seeking the next thing or, or what was it? Yeah, I think it was seeking the next thing. Getting out of LA was part of it too. I mean, my wife and I always liked the Bay Area, and, and uh, it was this was a shot to to move up there. Um, and computer animation was starting to you know intrigue me. I mean, Toy Story came out the first one, the time that I was working at um, uh, Turner and Warner's doing the Catstone Dance, and it was just so different. I mean, it was like nothing. There was definitely a shift, change. Like, wow, this is this is different. This is not, you know, not only was it a good film and story, but the technology was new and, you know, I'd never seen it done this way with character animation and everything. And I had a friend who was up there working on Monsters, Inc. She was working in story and uh, she she suggested, she said, you should try to do story, which I'd done a little bit here and there, a little bit of storyboarding, but, but not on a feature or anything like that. Uh, And I thought, well, let's try it. What let, you know, this, this could be a new challenge and exciting and, you know, Pixar is doing amazing work. And so I was really lucky and fortunate that they hired me and, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was just wanting to do something new and, and different. And I did not expect 2D to go away as fast as it did. (laughs) You know, when I went up there, I mean, I had an inkling like, oh, this is the future and there's going to be a lot more of this, but I didn't think, it was going to replace it as much as it seems to have done. You know, I thought they'd be in tandem the way you have stop motion and you have computer animation. You'd also have features that were, were traditionally animated, but that hasn't been the case. It's, it's, it's yeah. uh, gone a lot faster than I expected. <laughs> no. And I, I kind of hope that it does come back a little bit. It's because again, I, I think that for yeah. a lot of us, the nostalgia of, you know, growing up on, especially Disney films and, and of course, Warner brothers as well. But um you know there's just something about it it's just a it's a different world and yeah as you know for for me i think the addiction of 3d was me coming from doing more traditional 2d work just still being a kid at that point but just seeing like the the shiny plasticky look that you know early 90s 3d would do but just thinking like I can't draw that, you know, or I can't do it very, very well. So right, right. It, was, it was just kind of like this shortcut to doing something that looks really great. And these days now, obviously you've got a lot more freedom to kind of control the look of, of something, but um, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's not quite the same. And I, you know, I, I do kind of hope that there ends up being a place down the line where it kind of ends up kind of coming back a lot more strong as, you know, Hey, you know, 3d was not a fad, but you know, um, definitely blew up in a big way. And now yeah. it's kind of, come back to you know we've got this type of film and, and that type of film um, I, I would love to see more traditional animated features i think it would be great i the reason i went one of the other reasons i went to story up there was that i wasn't sure i was ready to give up the pencil i didn't know if i'd want to animate on the computer so story was a nice place to be i'll, I'll you know, hmm. oh i'm still gonna get to draw and and um Fortunately, the, the lucky thing that is that I got to actually do t- traditional animation at Pixar, which I never thought would happen. I got to work on the end credits for Ratatouille, and um, I was a co-supervising animator on Your Friend the Rat, which was directed by Jim Capabianco, and it was done for the um, the DVD. That was traditional, and then Teddy Newton's Short Day and Night, I got to do uh, traditional animation on that. So that I never expected that to happen. I thought, oh, I'm going to be at Pixar. I'm probably giving up 2D. 
and just things kind of happened that those things happened and um so they really didn't come over to your desk and like snap the pencil in half and hand you a mouse <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no actually I, I i was excited once i got into animating on the computer i was afraid of it at first or just wasn't sure i would enjoy it because i like the drawing part so much of animating mm -hmm. um, some people who who don't like the drawing part as much but they like the performance more don't mind like i've seen really good traditional animators that draw really really well and they don't miss drawing at all they're like oh i never really liked, liked the drawing i like the animating part wow. i tended to like both so not being able to draw it wasn't something i was ready to rush rush into but once i finally did especially the first thing i animated on at pixar was the incredibles and that was going to be something that tried to feel like a traditionally animated movie in the computer i mean the design yeah. sense the feel of it and everything uh so brad bird was looking for people who you know also did traditional animation so i was lucky i was there at the right time that film was happening and it was a nice segue after having boarded on it to to get to do the computer um and it, it and i learned to enjoy it a, you know a lot actually it was it, it it's very fun to, to they're both it's both acting it's both performance it's it's um you know they both have different uh, different pluses and minuses i guess <laughs> i think that just the fact that it takes much much more work to kind of get you know even that one key pose than it in some ways than it might be just to say hey i can just draw it up instead it's like especially a facial expression it's going to be a, a lot more work initially to kind of get that if it's if it's a new technology too yeah, it was definitely a big learning curve. Um, but the, the neat thing about it was like, wow, here's the, you know, Incredibles was really well designed. The characters are great and everything. So it was like great to have this model in the computer that's really appealing, you know, and your job is to not mess it up to try to keep that <laughs> appeal, <laughs> you know, which is kind of nice. Like, wow, I can actually, you know, this looks like Tony Fucilli's drawing because Tony Fucilli designed it. <laughs> so that was kind of, you know, nice to have that. That's um, great inspiration and everything right and there that, in front of you <laughs> i'm kind of curious about that like when you first got told or requested um whichever it was and i'd love to hear like um yeah to go into 3d i mean what was it like at that point i mean I'm, i you know I, I just picture that's kind of like a a big shift when you when you're actually making that decision okay i'm gonna go and give up what i've kind of relied on in terms of uh the tools that i use yeah um to now go and take on something that you know is pretty intimidating um yeah like what was it like like just kind of mentally going through that well what the reason i i wanted to get into animating on that film in particular was that brad was bringing up a lot of traditional animators that were friends of mine to mm -hmm. that film you know and people i worked with down in southern california were suddenly coming up there and they were all trying it they were like no this is actually going to be fun and then it kind of got me more interested in it you know, thinking, well, we'll all hold hands and jump into the, into this together. <laughs> so, and, um, uh, yeah, and the film was just so fun to work on and, and inspiring. It, I, you know, I didn't want it to end. So the chance to be able to animate on it, stay on it longer was, was a great opportunity. So everything just kind of came together at, at the right, the right time. That's great. Yeah. And obviously Pixar is all proprietary software, but what were the tools that you're using at the time? Uh, Menvi is the, um, the, their proprietary animation program. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's, and it's, I guess it's Maya based. I've never worked in anything but Menvi, mm -hmm. uh, but I've seen mine. It looks, it, it looks similar, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's what that they use now. Now it's changed a lot since I've animated on it, especially since Incredibles. I mean, they have drawing tools now and, um, just so many things that are easier to do. In fact, at the time, um, they set it up for all of us traditional animators to, when we animated on that movie to, they made this uh, new program called X sheet which for people who don't know what an X sheet is it's an exposure sheet uh, that you you number you have your frames frames um, counted out and everything and you can kind of visually see the the footage as far as the, the how many frames you have or how many how many feet your scene is and coming from that background you you tend to work pose to pose in animation. It's not straight ahead. So that program allowed you to kind of do your key poses and show your scene as a pose test with, without all the smooth in-betweens and everything. So for people like me, it was a great transition tool to, to learning the computer because I could kind of 
hang on to what I was used to. And then as I got more comfortable with the computer, I get rid of those training wheels and just dive into the computer, you know, full force. Um, so, but yeah, it, it, it's definitely changed now, you know, the way they, they animate. And I mean, I haven't animated on the computer in uh, quite a while now. So um, I couldn't tell you exactly all the changes, but I've seen mm-hmm. things here and there once in a while when I've been in an animator's room. I'm like, wow, that, that's, <laughs> that's, oh, I wish we had that back then. That's a great tool. Oh, man. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I, I was curious because, I mean, I remember, I think it was 97, 98 when I got into Maya and that's when it first came out. And that was like one of the big selling points for it was that, you know, the software is so intuitive that, mm-hmm. you know, you it would have all these, because like, sorry, I'm jumping around, but the marketing campaigns that Alias Wavefront had at the time were brilliant. Like it was more about marketing than it was about the software. The software was great, yeah. but they really figured out what the pain points would be for artists, especially those coming from uh, more traditional backgrounds like 2D. So they would, um, you know, interview all these like cell animators saying like, oh yeah, I jumped on the computer and it was so easy to pick up. And I I am kind of curious, not specifically Maya, but just kind of seeing someone coming from 2D and adapting it. Because I mean, I don't know, like I look at um, like ILM, for instance, going and using their proprietary software over some of the ones that I kind of grew up on. And it's just some of the stuff can be such a huge learning curve initially. And uh, for something that's completely a different concept, like doing cell animation to hopping on a computer with a mouse and expecting the mouse to be able to, you know, magically give you the same results, I'd imagine it's a bit of a, a mental learning curve. It, it was. It was huge. I think if I were to do it now with the, the way they're animating now in the software, it probably would be much easier transition. Not that it would be super easy, but easier than it was back then. I mean, I, it, I had to change my whole way of thinking. The way people talk about it, and I've never learned a foreign language, but they said it's like learning a foreign language. <laughs> Where it's like you're working, you know, you know how to speak, you know how to talk, you know words, but now you got to learn these new words. And they said people who learn a foreign language say there's that point where it finally just clicks. It's like they can finally just speak the language and understand it and think in the language. And that's kind of what it's, I think computer animation was like, it's like the struggle, struggle. You think I'm not going to get this. And then one day it's like, Oh, it's starting to make sense. Now I get, it. I know where all the buttons are. I know the tools. I can kind of navigate it. Um, and it, it, yeah, so it was, for me, it was a steep learning curve. I, I took a while before I felt, comfortable on it. Incredibles was was a great one to start on. And then I worked on cars after that. That was actually a great one to work on after the Incredibles because that one I got to learn the computer better. Because there's things that, you know, it's easier when you're animating a car to use the computer and use what the computer can give you for free, you know, instead of posing everything out. Um, mm-hmm. So I started to learn more about the splines and going in there and and um, using curves and figuring out how to, you know, smooth things out and that kind of thing. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think you take something from each film and kind of build on it and learn. <laughs> yeah. Notch on your belt. <laughs> well, yeah. I guess like with, uh, with Incredibles, like when you finish that, like how'd it feel? I kind of, you know, at this point, I'm sure you had a, a bunch of feature films where it's like, all right, great. Like I worked on that and I got it all done, but at the same time, kind of also having the accomplishment of going to a new, uh, you know, uh, workflow and having completed the project. I mean, was that kind of like one of those ones that you look back on like, hell yeah, like that was a, a massive hurdle and we nailed it. Well, I mean, it was exciting. I, I mean, I'm just lucky to have been on it. You know, I mean, anything I did on it, what, you know, I just, I was just there at the right time. I got to work on a great film and um, it was honestly all luck and, and being on that film. So um, it, it did turn out great. It was exciting. Everybody was excited working on it and knew that that it was special. I mean, when Brad came in, you know, with the movie, it was a great idea. Everyone was excited about it. Everyone was excited to work with him because he'd done Iron Giant. So it really was a, a really fun time uh, to be at Pixar on the, on that film in particular. That's so, cool. yeah, sometimes you're just at the right right place. You know, I mean, you you know, you may have the ability to work on that film, but you know, there's mm-hmm. plenty of films you don't get to work on. You just weren't there to <laughs> work out or whatever. So I felt yep. pretty, pretty lucky. <laughs> That's great. And I guess for you, like over your extensive career, I mean, what do you think is probably the most challenging project you've, you've ever worked on? The most challenging? Uh, Prince of Egypt would be up there because that was a big learning curve and probably Incredibles. Those two were probably the most challenging things I, I worked on. Because on Incredibles, 
I had only done a year in story on Monsters, Inc. So I did two years of story on Incredibles. And Brad really wants the shots in your storyboards to be what's going to be in the movie. So I feel like it was a steep learning curve for me. I just learned a lot on how to board on that film. Um, and then I learned a lot, like I said, on Prince of Egypt, doing a more realistic human character. Mm. So those, those two, I mean, every film has a challenge. But those are the ones that, I, that stand out as being um, the biggest challenges for me personally. You know? That's awesome. And what yeah. about your favorite? My favorite film to work on actually is uh, Catstone Dance, which is a little film that most people don't even know about. <laughs> but it's probably the film I had the most fun on and um, just really enjoyed the heck out of. It's directed by Mark Dindle, who did Emperor's New Groove and mm -hmm. Chicken Little for Disney. And it's just a, it was a fun, funny film, a really great crew. It was very cartoony. Um, and just that, that was the film I really enjoyed the most. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll, have to, I'll have to check it out at some point. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, again, like with Molly and the Bear, I mean, that's obviously one of the things that you're putting a lot of uh, your heart and soul into at the moment as well. Yes. So, I mean, yeah. uh, do you want to give us a bit of an introduction to what Molly and the Bear is about? Sure. Yeah. Um, Molly and the Bear, formerly Molly and the Bear, now called Bear With Me, although the book is still Molly and the Bear. <laughs> I, I apologize. I recently changed, changed the, the title, but... Um, yeah, I, I've been drawing that for years. I've always loved comic strips. Uh, going back to, you know, it was always animation comic strips and and, and neither, neither of them fully won out. I, I just had my feet in both. And uh, it's a comic strip that I would send to syndicates years ago. So I've been working on, it, working on it on and off again for like 15 or so years, maybe wow. longer, actually 20 years, I think. Uh, and about eight years ago, I got syndicated. I started putting it online, and uh, Go Comics, which is Universal Press Syndicate, picked it up as a syndicated comic strip just for the web. So um, it's it's really a labor of love. I mean, I don't really make much money from it. I do two strips a week. Anyways, that and I I draw it traditionally. I draw it on paper. I ink it with a brush, and I just I love doing it. It's just it's fun. There's a book out now that came out about a year and a half ago. So that was exciting to actually have it in print. Um, and my background is in comic strips as well. One of the places I worked early on in my career was uh, working for Jim Davis in Indiana. My wife and I both worked there. Um, and I ghosted along with another artist there. We did the penciling for a strip called US Acres. It was another comic strip that Jim Davis did after Garfield. And uh, that, was a, that was a really fun project to work on. I mean, it was just fun to be working in a, on a comic strip and so I've always done comic strips on the side, and and this is the one I've been doing um, for for years now, and really enjoying doing it. That's great. That's yeah. really cool. And so right now, like, um, you know, typically, like, what uh, platform do you, are you usually publishing stuff on? Uh, so it's on Go Comics, which is um, so GoComics.com is where you mm -hmm. go, and they they syndicate Doonesbury, and they have reruns of Calvin and Hobbes, and Bloom County's on there. And just hundreds of other uh, webcomic only strips, um, and web based strips, and then they also have the ones that are in the newspaper. Um, so, yeah, so twice a week it's on there. I also post it on Facebook myself. And then Go Comics has it syndicated to different uh, newspapers online and that sort of thing. Oh, that's great. So, yeah, so it, it's, it's uh, just a labor of love, like I said. I just, I love comic strips and always, always have. <laughs> And enjoy doing them and it's and it's very similar to story in a lot of ways i think the two feed off of each other mm -hmm. things i've learned from story have helped my strip and have done in my strip have helped my story work you know trying to do a, a gag in three or four panels you know it took me years to kind of figure out how to do that better and I'm, of course i'm always learning but i remember my first strips were you know the stuff i did when i was at, at cal arts i actually had a strip in the local paper there based on my student film and I would do mm -hmm. twi twice a week there while I was going to Cal Arts. And I look back on those now and they're so wordy. I mean, just so many, you know, over explaining the joke and everything. And you know, at the time I didn't realize that. So now, I've, you know, over the years doing it, you learn to use less words, you know, to make your point and, and that sort of thing. So, but that stuff has been invaluable for, for story as well, you know, because a yeah. lot of times you're coming up with ideas and gags of your, your own. You might have an assignment where it's just like, we're not ready to hand this off to you yet, but come up with ideas for the sequence. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, you kind of think of it as a comic strip, like here's just one panel kind of representing this 
this scene? What's the storytelling, you know, drawing for this? And, and you know, what, if you don't have dialogue yet, what would the characters say? And they're asking for a gag, you know, those types of things have really helped doing like, comic strips have helped me with I, that. As I well. like that. And I think that kind of having that um, output as well, just like a personal place that you can throw out ideas and, and just try things out without needing it to be within, you know, the, I'll say limitations of someone else's vision. Um, yeah, I, I think that's just like a great way that you can try out ideas and, and kind of grow the same yeah. way, like, you know, it's kind of working out at the gym. It's just, it's exercise in the area that you're doing. So that way when it's go time and you're, you know, going to start applying this to the other things you're working on, a lot of those ideas you can kind of pick and choose from uh, to apply to what you're doing. So I think it's right. awesome. Yeah, and I also like that it's something that you can do by yourself in the evening, you know, I can have one strip done in an hour and a half or two hours, depending on the detail of the strip. And so it's nice to, it's, it's not an overwhelming project. It's not like, you know, I'm drawing a graphic novel that's 500 pages long. You know, I'm just slowly chipping away at strips. And then over the course of years, there was enough for a book, you know? So it's like, it's nice to, it's like, wow, here's a finished project that didn't seem like I was killing myself to do, which is kind of nice too. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's cool. And just curious, I mean, obviously you've been in the industry for quite a while. So um, I, I just figure like, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of advice for people who are trying to break into the industry as well as just in general, seeing how, you know, a lot of people uh, kind of do uh, work throughout their career. I mean, right. for you, I guess um, for people kind of breaking into the industry in the beginning, uh, especially in animation, like, do you have any advice that you can give to them? Well, if they're if they're going into yeah if they're going to an, animation uh, and they want to be in visual development or storyboarding, which is I mean I'm in storyboarding, so that's usually the people I meet and talk to, uh, is just to draw and draw and then draw some more, <laughs> you know, just because there's so much drawing involved in animation and, and especially nowadays with storyboarding, there's there's so many more poses that you do, you know, um, you've got to be a cameraman, an actor. You've got to be good at drawing a lot of different things, characters and backgrounds, and you just have to have those drawing skills. So the more you draw, um, the better it's going to be for you, you know, when you are drawing. If you don't like drawing that much, I mean, you know, some people think they want to do it and they don't, I'll see their sketchbook and they don't really draw very much. And um, you can tell right away if somebody's really really into it if you've seen them at one convention and then a year later you see them again and the sketchbook is pretty much the same drawings you saw last <laughs> time you know it's maybe not not they're you know really something they want to do and maybe they're better at another aspect of animation maybe they're, they'd be really good as a writer or something else um, but i just say just just draw all you can i mean if if you love drawing and you keep drawing your stuff's going to get better and better and you're going to have a better shot at at, at making it that's um, cool yeah and this is one that I'm always kind of curious about these days. It's more about like mistakes that you see mm -hmm. artists making early in their career. Cause I think that um, it's such a critical one. I've interviewed a few studios now where like doing a round table with them, where I've just said like, what are the big red flags that when people send their reel in, for instance, just because I feel like um, most people try and think of like what they should be doing mm -hmm. uh, in their career rather than really kind of focusing on what they shouldn't be doing. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, actually I had a call I think it was yesterday or day before last mm -hmm. uh, with a podcast guest. And we're, we're talking about this, about, you know, essentially the more that you put on your reel, the more you're being opened up for scrutiny. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. less is more in, in, in the sense that, um, you know, it's, it's going to be enough to kind of showcase what you can do without kind of showcasing too much and, um, you know, causing a few red flags or, or right. things to kind of pop up. So just for you, I mean, what do you think is some of the big mistakes that, people kind of tend to make when they first kind of get in there, either being too cocky or whatever it might be? Uh, you, usually the, what I see sometimes is, is a portfolio that has too many different things in it. They've got visual development, they've got a little animation, they've got um, storyboarding, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't look like they know exactly what it is they want to do. And I, I understand that. It's like you want to show like, um, I'll, I'll do anything in animation. I just want to get in there. So you want to show a little bit of everything. But I think it's good to focus on the thing you enjoy the most and um, and maybe have a couple samples of those other things. But if you want to go into visual development, then your portfolio should primarily be visual development. You know, and if it's animation, you want to have mostly animation and it's the you know, same with storyboarding. Um, the other thing that that I 
uh, tell people, usually you meet people and they all just want to work at Disney. That's all they, mm-hmm. they really want to do. And it's like the, the only place they want to want to be. And I tell them, you know, you're young. There's so many great places you can work at. If you don't get into Disney now, you will down the road and you're going to learn from wherever you go. And sometimes it's better to go to a place, a smaller studio where you get to, you know, do more and learn and, you know, learn more without the same stress, you know, being thrown into a big feature film. You know, Um, I feel like I learned so much being at smaller places, you know, working for Jim Davis on a comic strip. It was a small studio. You know, I worked for Warner Brothers, um, special projects on on some Bugs Bunny stuff early on in my career. And that was just shorts and commercials and things like that. And I feel like I, I just learned so much at those at those places. So not to underestimate that and and just get not to get your sets, your sights set on just one studio. Love the art form. And, you know, you'll get in there eventually if that's what is if that's what you want. And that's not to say don't try, but um, mm-hmm. you know, it, I was very focused only on Disney when I was younger. Like if I don't get into Disney, my career means nothing, you know? <laughs> and I learned that doesn't, that's not necessarily, you know, that's not the case. You, you, you meet all kinds of amazingly talented people that for whatever reason aren't at Disney, they don't even want to be at Disney or they were there and they didn't like it or they, you know, they found something else they liked more. So there's, you know, that I think it's good to, to just love the art form and, and there's and there's so much animation now in so many places you can work you know yeah. such a variety of, of of styles and shows and animation and everything no i, I think it's really great advice because again like uh you know I, I think that you're limiting yourself by having your site set on one just one thing and i also think right. that getting exposure to smaller places in the beginning is really worth your while because you'll be able to move up quicker you'll be exposed to a lot more different stuff quicker yeah. and, and the more you jump around to uh, rather than going in somewhere that let's say it is a two or three year turnaround on a project. Like I highly doubt that during yeah. that time, you're going to get the growth that you want. Right. And right. I was talking, I think it was, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it was Victor Navone uh, when uh-huh. we was chatting with him in, in his episode. Um, yeah. Just about like how I'm pretty sure it was him, but he wanted to apply at, at ILM and he was so happy that when he didn't get into ILM, just because um, you know, it kind of opened up some doors eventually to Pixar through that because, um, you know, essentially getting rejected from there kind of gave um, the opportunity of Pixar, which ended up being, you know, worth its weight in gold. So, you know, sometimes I think that, let's say if you do have your heart set on something, you never know, like maybe it is the wrong place. And uh, if you if you were to kind of just fixate on that and not, uh, you know, uh, tackle any other opportunities at all, then you might miss out on that dream job that you fall in love with down the line. Absolutely. Yeah. I, that was him. I, I heard that interview and I thought that was really good. Um, a good story because it's, and it's great advice because you might not be looking at the opportunity right in front of your face. Cause you're so focused on this other thing. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's great advice. And just curious, like, what are you working on at the moment? Uh, right now I'm at Disney and I'm working on, it's actually been announced so I can say what it is. Well, I was working on Wreck-It Ralph 2 for about a year and a half. Nice. And now I'm on, um, it's a Jets film, which is going to be, it's a spinoff in the planes world, the cars world. So I'm working on that in story right now. And I'm actually working with Mark Dindle again, which is great. <laughs> and he's so fun to work with. Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm working on during cool. the, and I'm in, and then, uh, excuse me. I'm in story. I've been in story for quite a while. Now I've been animated on the computer in, in a while. So I really enjoy doing story. It's, it's mm-hmm. where I'm enjoying it the most right now. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really yeah. great. And where would people go to find out more about you? Um, whether it be going to, again, I'm going to say Molly and the bear, but what was the, oh, that's the- fine. What is um, the updated title? Just so I can oh, the, the title now is Bear With Me, but the book is still still called Molly and the Bear. So, um, yeah, so they can go to gocomics.com and read the strip twice a week. Um, there's a Facebook page with Bear With Me. Um, and that's, yeah, that those are pretty much the places. I Well, there's also a mollyandthebear.com, which is where Great. I call the strip there as well. But, but Go Comics is probably the best place to go. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. And well, again, I want to thank you for taking the time to chat. This has been awesome. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, it was nice chatting with you.
I hope you enjoyed that episode. Again, thanks to Bob for taking time out to do this episode. And I hope you got a lot from it. So if you want to check out the show notes, go to alanmckay.com slash 134 for episode 134. And if you can take a moment to share this around, that would mean the world to me. I'd love everyone to get as much from this as possible. A couple other really big announcements coming up very, very soon. One that I'm really excited about is I'll be opening up the mentorship for registration for 2018 for this year in a couple of weeks time. So I only open this up once per year and it'll be coming up early April. So if you want to be a part of that, make sure to join the inner circle, my VIP mailing list so you can get a heads up before anyone else. Cause sometimes we don't actually open it up publicly because it fills up before I ever opened the doors to the public because there's such a big waiting list. So if you want to be a part of this, get on the mailing list and I'll be giving a heads up to everyone on there before anyone else. So go to alamckay.com slash inside to jump on the inner circle VIP mailing list and I'll be announcing registration very soon as well. That being said, I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, rock on.